Director for Small Business at Defense Acquisition University, or DAU. What that means is I'm responsible for cradle to grave of the, for the learning assets that we deploy for the small business professionals in the defense acquisition workforce. We're excited that you're listening to our podcast. It talks to anybody that's concerned about what's going on with small businesses in our defense industrial base. So this is for government, this is for industry, this is for academia. We'd like you to follow the podcast. We'd like you to be a champion, share it. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. If you're a new listener, we're glad you're here. Uh, my special guest today is from the Department of the Army. Uh, it's Miss Kim Bueller, and she is the director of the Army Office of Small Business Programs. So in that capacity, uh, she runs the Army Small Business Program uh, directly for the Secretary of the Army. Uh, she's passionate. She really knows her stuff. The Army's open for business, so I'm super excited. So welcome, Miss Bueller. Hi, welcome. Thank um, you. Thank um, you very much for having me to today. You. And may I call you Kim? Of course. Not Ken. I'm going to call you Kim. Yeah, Kim. Kim okay. and Ken from Kim New Jersey. Jersey. There so we, we go. can't possibly get that messed up. That's right. So you, you, you got to listen fast because we're both from New Jersey. That's right. That's awesome. So I mentioned that you are the director of the Army Office of Small Business Programs, or OSBP as the acronym. And we're going to try to stay off acronyms. We'll do our best to explain to them. But can you basically tell the audience, number one, how you got into your position and what you what that really role is what do you do in that role well it's a great starter question ken first thank you so much for inviting me here today to be with you and to do the podcast it's fun to do something new and especially something like a podcast that has such broad appeal and gives listeners the opportunity to engage uh, in accordance with their schedule and not a you know predetermined um, event schedule like we normally have in small business. Self-directed learning, yes. we call that. Uh, yes, we exactly. Call that self-directed learning. <laughs> so, how did I get into this job? That's an, an, an interesting one. So, uh, so this was my first SES. Um, position. Senior Executive Service. Senior Executive Service, exactly. Thank you. So the Senior Executive Service was established in order to uh, provide for continuity and as well as senior provide senior leadership advice to individuals that are making the important hard day-to-day -day decisions for our federal government, so within the federal agencies. So within the Department of the Army, I am the senior official charged with providing advice, guidance, and leadership for the Army's small business programs. So within that capacity, I serve as what's called a principal official of headquarters department of Army. And that means, um, you know, as with any military organization, of course, there's a lot of hierarchy and protocol involved, but the position is designated as a principal official specifically to emphasize the important role that small business plays within the department in supporting our military mission. So, so are you in the Pentagon? I am located in the Pentagon. I do work directly with the Under Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of the Army and the other senior leaders. Um, very heavily engaged with the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics and Technology. The individual that occupies that position is also designated as what's known as the Senior Procurement Executive, or the SPE. And as you can imagine, there's a very strong correlation between what I do in my role as an advocate for small business and what the acquisition um, executive and the Senior Procurement Executive do in uh, managing the acquisition enterprise. So, so are, you, are, you, are you directing acquisitions and procurements, or are you advocating for small business to participate in those acquisitions? So one of the first things I generally tell industry when I'm meeting with them is I don't have the money and I don't have the requirements. What I have is a seat at the table to advocate for their opportunity. It's the, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition and, Le and um, Logistics and Technology, or the ASALT, I'll just say the ASALT. ASALT okay. <laughs> uh, that's the individual who is in charge of the acquisition enterprise where they do have the money, the requirements, particularly for our major weapon systems platforms that support our soldiers. And the Army's mission, of course, is to fight and win our nation's wars. Where I come into play is trying to help engage small businesses to be on that journey with us to engage at both the prime and the subcontract level on our army requirements so whether it's building components of a major weapon system 
whether it's building a critical end item, whether it's supporting our uh, worldwide logistics footprint, our installations, we have, um, we buy almost everything you can think of within the Department of Army. So if the Army uses it, they got to buy it, and you may That's have a right. role in that. A exactly. So I'd imagine that those requirements can change. Indeed. So is it, in, is it important for you as the director of the Army's Office of Small Business Programs to be well aware of what the Army buys and how the Army buys to help train industry and how to participate? Would that be fair? I, I think that is fair. It It, it is really... Uh, difficult to separate the functions. Okay. Um, even though we report through separate chains of authority, we are joined at the hip in the work that we do. And in fact, most of the small business professionals, including myself, grew up in the contracting career field. So we are trained contracting professionals. There are some individuals out there who are also came through the program management. That's me. That's me. Is that you? That's me. That's me. <laughs> so we, we value our program managers that are in our workforce as well because, as you know, you bring a different perspective. Right. Right. And uh, acquisition it a, is a team sport for sure. We need our program managers, our contracting professionals, our lawyers, our small business professionals, our logisticians, right? Everybody has a seat at the table and has to play and cooperate in order to really deliver the, the end item products and, uh, and services. You know, the Army spends almost as much, really as much on services as we do on products. And a lot of people don't realize that, that if you historically... Mm -hmm. The, the DOD spends as much or more in services. So mm -hmm. services are great opportunities for small businesses to get in either as a prime or subcontractor. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, I, I would think that the competition is keen. If you're a services provider, you better be really good at what you do or you better have a, a real niche because it's mm -hmm. really competitive. If you just do logistics services, program management services, is that what you're seeing? It's really competitive. It, it, it is. We, we do have a lot of vendors in the professional services um, arena. And performance, of course, is king um, because that is always, it's always the hardest contract to get is your first one. So if you come through the door, if you're able to get that first contract, performance is really king. I hope you're listening. She's <laughs> kicking the podium now, the podcast podium. You gotta perform. You, you've gotta perform. Um, you know, and once you've demonstrated the ability to perform and you make those connections and people see what you can do, when the government officials see what you can do, it helps to lay the groundwork not only for future opportunity for that firm, but also other small business firms. You know, we can advocate all day long, but performance is really going to be king in breaking down barriers or hesitation, because sometimes our program managers, you know, they're, they are um, rewarded based on cost, schedule, and performance, right? Okay. Those are the three metrics. So you've got to come in with great performance at a good price, and you've got to keep us on schedule. And that's whether you're, it's at the prime or subcontract level. So, you know, I might be evaluated on the level of small business performance across the enterprise. Um, so that's important to me, but it's more important that our, our um, soldiers get what they need and that our program managers are able to fulfill their objectives. So at the end of the day, I think everybody agrees that it's, it's getting the requirements met so our, our soldiers get what they need to get their mission done. That's critical. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned about the, the cost schedule performance. So I think where you were going to go was some of the program managers may be a little hesitant to go to a small business. Not, small business is not always perceived as the first option <laughs> as opposed to maybe going to the large prime, the easy button. So how, yeah. how, how, do you deal, how do you deal with those discussions? I'm sure you're engaged almost daily in those discussions at your level probably. It, it, it can be difficult. Okay. Um, you, you definitely see, a, you see program managers that have had great experience with small business and they come to the table and understand that a small business isn't two guys sitting in a garage, right? There's all types and varieties of small businesses across the spectrum with very advanced capabilities. So when you meet one of those program managers who um, maybe didn't have that great of an experience, or maybe they're more of a newer program manager, and uh, you know are really um, super risk averse because they they are trying to to make a name for themselves and make a name for their their program maybe it's a newer program, um, you've really got to understand the industrial base. 
you have to be able to go in with examples. You have to show here are the companies that are in this space. They have been supporting these programs. They have been um, delivering capabilities successfully. successfully. Doing things, right? And if I can go in and show that they've not only done that for the Army, but that they've done that for other customers as well. Like the Navy, maybe? Ex maybe the <laughs> Navy, maybe the Air Force, maybe a Defense Logistics right. Agency. Right. Um, you know, then that's always uh, demonstrates that their capability a little bit better. But really having those examples in your back pocket to pull out is pretty important. Always helps. Yeah. So does that process, you get a, a program manager and they go through the cycle and, you know, it doesn't always have to be a small business solution, but we'd like it to be when the met market research and data shows it should be. Does that help you develop champions outside of your office? Now they are more able to work or is it always mm -hmm. redoing and reinventing the wheel and doing the process over again? So we absolutely want to make sure that we've got advocates for small business, not only designated as small business professionals, but across the spectrum. And small businesses have to be our partners in creating those good impressions and in, in doing that advocacy, right? There's nothing better than self-advocacy right. from the small businesses that are uh, on our requirements. Uh, but absolutely, when we get our, um, we have to have the tone at the top. Okay. So as and what's the top like so, the, the secretary of the army? Right. The okay. Absolutely. Right. Okay. So yeah, which of course you know we we get every four to eight years we've got a different secretary right. we have different assistant secretaries so there is a need to continually go in and educate on the small business program sometimes particularly if somebody has a heavy industry background they may not be that familiar with the statutory requirements for the small business programs and you have to take the time to educate them and and also understand what their priorities are and then you need to adapt your programmatic strategy to meet their objectives. And that's how, of course, you win anybody over, is in understanding what's important to that person and then um, identifying how the small business program can help them meet their objectives. So we teach that at DAU in, in our small business classes. We teach it as, as, as part of persuasion and influence. I think those are critical skills that a small business professional would have to be persuasive and to influence. I think those are those yes. are serious skills uh, that would be very important. And I really emphasize that, Ken, okay. because I, I want my small business professionals, when they get a seat at the table and they're talking to their customers and to contracting, I don't want them to be focused on, we have to meet a goal in a certain socioeconomic category, right? Those are important. But the goals shouldn't be an end in and of themselves. They should be the outcome of the persuasion. They should be the outcome of having a logical argument of understanding the industrial base and of being able to show the capability of small business. That's how you get those outcomes that, of course, our, you know, our federal government um, evaluates us on. But you're not going to win over any friends if you're just sitting at the table saying, well, you have to employ this strategy because we're not meeting our um, newly increased uh, goal right. for service-disabled veteran-owned businesses. Right. Nobody leaves the room until we say it's small business. That, that, right. ex that's exactly <laughs> right. I think that discussion about mm -hmm. goals and how the Army is, is doing and has done might be enough to maybe be another opportunity at some I, point. Yeah, I, I can think, talk about that we, for an hour. I think we could, we, we could exactly, <laughs> we, might, we might need two, two more podcasts for that. So you mentioned that there, there, there's several disciplines in the acquisition workforce. You mentioned a couple, logistics, mm -hmm. contracting, program management. Uh, contracting used to be and probably still is the, the career field where the majority of folks come in the small business. But it's been validated that other disciplines are certainly very helpful because it's broader than just having contracting knowledge. You need business acumen skills. You mm -hmm. need pro you understand cost schedule performance and all those things. Mm -hmm. So you came in with a, well, I guess, with a, with a distinctly contracting background, right? You, you've been in contracting the whole time, right? So oh, I have, okay. but I moved around. Okay. So I didn't. Well, do tell. Do yeah, tell so, how you moved around. Do so tell. the the. Yeah, you know, the traditional path for uh, a contracting professional is to start at an entry level. Okay. Um, and then you progressively work your way up to supervisory positions to be a contracting officer, and then usually into some sort of branch chief, division chief, 
um, or higher level position, such as a deputy director for a contracting office. Okay. And what makes a contract, what, what's the one thing that's really unique about a contracting officer? They have special privileges. What, 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 is, what is that privilege? Uh, the, well, the responsibility. They, I say responsibility. Okay. I don't know if they would consider it a privilege. But it's an honor and a privilege. It, it is an honor, <laughs> privilege, and a giant responsibility to be the only authorized official to actually obligate government funds on contracts. So if you're so. a small business and you're working on a contract and you get direction from someone other than a contracting officer, what do you do? You go to your contracting officer without delay right? because that individual, now we do have people called contracting Many, officers representatives right, and they do have a certain set of responsibilities. So if you have a core, you need to make sure that you understand the left and right limits of that individual's authority because if they direct you to do something that's outside that scope of authority, absolutely do not pass go, go to the contracting officer because otherwise you are working at risk. She's kicking the podium again on this <laughs> podcast. So I gave you a little bit of a curveball there. So there you are, you, you, you've grown up in contracting, you've mm -hmm. got through the, the supervisory, the, the, the branch chief, or I think you said or something. So I didn't, so, okay. I didn't go you, that path. You, okay, do tell, I you went somewhere not, else. I okay. did, um, okay. I, I knew early on okay. that I was gonna take a non-traditional path okay. in the contracting lane because I wanted to see different things. Okay. And I had an interest in career development, career management, so I took a job um, so I was on the floor, you know, executing contracts, and I took a left turn and went into um, career, the career development for the contracting career program within the Army. So I was actually managing what we called back then the intern program, okay. uh, which today is a fellows program or the entry level program. And can that job, that position was really the gateway to other opportunities because I had, through that one job, I had the opportunity to meet all of the senior contracting officials, the heads of the contracting activities, the senior leadership within the Pentagon for contracting, the networking that I was able to do opened doors for me in other positions. So sometimes a left turn is a really good turn. Yes. I remember when I was at Naval Air <laughs> Systems Command, I, I got involved after I got asked twice by the SES, Senior Executive Service, to apply the NAV Air Leadership Development Program. And it was a three-year development program. Same thing. All of a sudden, I was meeting with the SESs and all these <laughs> things, and it, it opens up uh, terrifically your opportunity. So, yeah. so mm -hmm. as a senior leader now, I think that's something in your back pocket how you are training and coaching and mentoring Absolutely. your folks, mm -hmm. how you're helping skill development, workforce development. Mm -hmm. So that was something strategically that you brought into your, your position now. Absolutely. Okay, But yeah. you're, you're on that mm -hmm. left turn and it's going really well. <laughs> so did you continue left or what did you do after that? I continued left, but with a few detours. Okay. So I, um, from that position, um, I actually, took a career development position with the Army's G357. So those are the operators. Okay. So I went outside the career field. Okay. And um, I didn't know whether that was a good idea or not. But they let you back in. They let me back in okay. within six months. Okay. Because okay. they had an opportunity and because I had the networks, oh, right. they said, you know what, we, we're standing up a new organization and we want you to lead that. Nice. I was like, okay, well, Thank you to the Army. I'm going back to this other part of the Army mm -hmm. where I'm frankly at home. Right. Um, I did learn a lot from mm -hmm. that time of not being within the acquisition framework because I think we take it for granted the level of opportunity you have as an acquisition professional. The training that you are required to take that some people see as a burden, frankly, is such an opportunity. Now you're definitely not talking about DAU training being a burden, right? And, but the, but there are people that think that any kind of training is right, a burden, yeah. right? They just want to do their job, go to work. Um, I would say that those are the folks that, um, you know, we should try to weed out maybe early in their career, to be frank about it, right. because we want people who are lifelong learning. So, right. Because contracting changes constantly. Acquisition changes constantly. So you have to be flexible, you have to be adaptive, you have to learn and you have to want to learn. Which is a, one of the primary purpose of, of this podcast. Yeah. Is, I mean, we can deliver mm -hmm. learning a lot faster 
with a podcast or a webinar mm -hmm. than we can when we got to develop a whole new course or whatever, yeah. whether it's DAU mm -hmm. or, you know, I know the services have their own training uh, mm -hmm. mechanisms, like, you know, in the Navy, they have Navar University, uh, Air Force has Air Force Institute of Technology, mm -hmm. Army probably has something similar mm -hmm. where they develop, you know, training for, for the Army. But it, it's much easier and quicker to do something like this. So we're actually mm -hmm. delivering learning to anybody that might be listening to this mm -hmm. podcast. So I, 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 yeah. I appreciate that. So, so, you're, so you came back mm -hmm. into contracting, yep. you got that passion for learning, yep. and then what did you do with it? Um, I ended up being the top procurement policy person for the Army. So you're policy wonk too. I, policy wonk. It was, and that was okay. my, that's my heart, that's my love. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it really was a fantastic job. I had the opportunity to build really a great team. Okay. Um, so you talk about, you know, how do you build a high performing team? I don't know. <laughs> I just, it, it's it just like happened. magic. It was like magic. Okay, that's that's um, an approach. But I, but I think uh, no. But seriously, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that finding people that have a shared passion for their work, a commitment to the mission, and who are willing to think creatively, it is really it's hard to do. Um, but I, I was very fortunate to attract a great team of talents that made me look good. Um, you know, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, there were, one of my leadership philosophies is I try very hard not to ask anybody to do anything I'm not willing to do myself, right? Maybe I can't do uh, it because uh, I don't have a level right. of expertise, but I'm going to be there with you. I I'm going to be one. figuring it out. You know, we've got to work as a team. I'm just as much a part of the team as I am the leader for the team. And, um, you know, I think that, I think people do respond to that. You know, if you're there with them, even just for moral support, sometimes it goes a long way. And um, so we just built this great, um, this great high performing team. And I, it was in an area that I loved. I mean, I really do, um, I, even though I don't read the FAR, you know, for uh, bedtime learning, the FAR is the Federal Acquisition Regulation, so that's our, our Bible, it's our guidebook. Thick. It's thick. <laughs> it's very thick. And then, of course, we've got all the supplements. Right. I don't read that for pleasure at night, but I do love diving into into what the regulations right. say and don't say. Okay. It's important to know that both. It is important. And you yes. as a small business that mm -hmm. want to do business or are doing business mm -hmm. with the Department of Defense, Army, or whatever that you're, you're providing, you you need to understand the policy, you need to understand the regulations, and you need to be very familiar, intimately familiar with your contract, the terms and conditions that yes. are in your contract. So Absolutely. did you so then did you go from that policy position to the director position or did you have another yes. turn? Nope, that was it. Okay, I, so you're you're mm -hmm. you're in you're in the job that you love, mm -hmm. you're eating and drinking policy, <laughs> you got you got the dream team. And then you wind up being the director mm -hmm. of small business. How yeah. did that happen? Well, it was um, something I really never envisioned for myself. Okay. I, I really was very happy in the position that I had with the team that I loved. But just as I said, the, the only thing that uh, you can guarantee yourself is that there's going to be change. Mm -hmm. I did see a lot of change occurring around me, both organizationally, within the government, and frankly, with um, with the views towards small business. Um, when the job came open, I looked around, I looked to my left, I looked to my right, which is another learning point that I had very early in my career when one of my former supervisors said, you know, don't, never say never. Right. Because you're gonna look around one day and you're gonna, you're gonna see people that you don't think have the skill sets that you do who are going to become your boss and if you don't go for it then that that's it for you right that you're going to be working for people that um, even though they're great fine americans you may um you know find yourself thinking that you are um that your skills are a little stronger than theirs okay. right um and i started looking around and i saw my peers getting into SES positions and I thought to myself why am I holding myself back it's not that I'm better than these people but I think that I have something to contribute okay just like they believed that they had something to contribute 
So um, I felt like I had something to contribute in the small business arena. And I wanted to make sure that I took that opportunity if it was afforded to me and didn't self-limit. Okay. Um, because I, I think sometimes we, particularly as females in the workplace, we can do that. And this is, um, you know, every year we have, um, you know, Women's History Month. And, you know, we really take time to honor the, the women out there who have gone the extra mile, broken through the glass ceiling, contributed, you know, extraordinary um, uh, efforts. And, you know, when you, when you look around, you, can, you have to decide at some point, do I want to try to be like that and honor the legacy of those great leaders? Wow. Um, or am I just going to, you know, stay in place? Right. And I decided to do something different. And, and it worked. Well, I don't know. The jury might be still no, out. No, 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 no. You, you, I... you, 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 well, you, you got the you, you, I got the you job. Got the position. <laughs> and you've given a whole lot of career advice. So that that was going to be one of the questions. But you answered that brilliantly about some career advice about, you know, sometimes it's not straight. Sometimes it is a winding road or left and right turns. But you got you got into that job. And I, I think, I, I know I'm, I'm getting younger every day, so I'm trying to remember, but I know I started at DAU back in August of 2019. I think you started the same month, I believe, right? Or I, pretty I did. Pretty close. So, I, same month. Right, same month. Yes. So, yeah. so mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of how I, yeah, we, we cross paths. So we've known each other now for a couple of years mm -hmm. working collaboratively. And, and I, I definitely think that I, I see that in action because, you, you know, you invited me about a year ago mm -hmm. to help facilitate a, an offsite for your Army staff. Uh, in mm -hmm. your in your office because you're not an office of one you you have a staff that you, you got to run Absolutely. and I can see how mm -hmm. you, you manage that offsite and, and, and the interactions mm -hmm. so we're, here you are now you, you took you, you stepped out into an unknown into small business uh, not not much mm -hmm. of a background in small business yeah you, you inherit or you got to build a staff so here you are now what I think almost four years later so f almost five years later yeah Hard to believe. What what what, what was probably the, what was the biggest challenge you had going in that that you thought or either either you planned on it or you realized this is my biggest challenge. So I knew going in that my biggest challenge was perceptions about small business. Okay. Um, there had been a lot of work done within the army on reform, and there were um, there were just some forces at play that um, it's hard to articulate it in a way that your listeners are going to um, relate to, but there were forces that were interested in other things, right? Small business was a back burner issue. Um, goals were honestly not important at all. Okay. Um, I think that is easy. That's an easy position to have when you are in an activity that has great performance already. Right. I always think back to the balanced scorecard approach, and I know nobody talks about that anymore. There's more modern, you know, uh, methodologies, but I always liked balanced scorecard. That got brought up at the last NCMA conference I was at. Somebody, oh, brought, it, really? somebody brought it up. Not not in a favorable way either. But oh, really? Yeah. So I always liked it. So what, what, somebody somebody yeah. that's listening made it. What, yeah. what is ba balanced? What is balanced scorecard? It's so not like bingo. What, it, so what what is it? Well, it was kind of like bingo. <laughs> So in a, under a balanced scorecard, everything was on the table, but as you placed as you place emphasis in one area of your operation, say financials, you're you are doing that with the recognition that you're willing to take risk in other areas. In other words, you can't do everything to the same degree at all at the same time. There's not enough money, time, resources to pay attention to everything. So for those areas that you want to work on, that you want to emphasize, you're going to put more of your resources towards that, and you're going to take risk in other areas. I think when I came into the job, so I know when I came into the job, the emphasis was in other areas. You know, the Army undertook the largest modernization effort that it had in a significant period, possibly since you know, World War II. Right. I mean, it was really extraordinary the amount of focus that the army um, that the army was was forced to put into modernization, um, and it was an opportunity, right? So it was an opportunity for the army to um, 
to advance our platforms to invest in in new technologies you know divest ourselves of legacy systems and make sure that we're prepared to meet our our pacing challenge um, as well as our near peer competitors and if we didn't make that investment we wouldn't be ready so that became the priority um, at, along with readiness, right? Because we, we also, as much as we're modernizing, we also have to be ready to fight today, right? And those are pretty important priorities. Those are think. very pretty important. Pretty important priorities. Yes, yes. So, so when I came in and the emphasis was not on small business, okay. I made it my job to tie what we were doing in small business directly to those priorities. That, again, so the Army could see itself right and see how the two were not mutually exclusive, but how what we were doing with the small business programs supported modernization and supported readiness. So they you were made, not made, separate made it relevant. You, okay. it, right, if you don't make it relevant, you'll be irrelevant. So four and a half, almost five years later, how, how, overall, mm -hmm. how's the Army doing? Um, we are, so our modernization, you know, we deployed um, a, a, a bunch of new platforms um, this fiscal year, I think like 27 new platforms. So our modernization efforts are um, really showing the dividends that we hope from that investment. We have many small businesses that are on that journey with us and delivering critical um, components, both at the, the prime and subcontract level. Our investment in the small business innovation research um, programs and authorities you know, we have um, we've been very successful and very focused on transitioning technologies developed under those, um, you know, experimental research and development areas into our platforms. In fact, we developed some um, initiatives to help uh, uh, accelerate those, that transition of technologies. Right. Um, you know, that valley of death that everybody, everybody talks about. Everybody yeah. talks yeah. about. Yeah. Um, so we, we've really been focused on, um, you know, how to leverage the authorities that we have um, to, to make sure that small businesses have come along. And we've been, we've been doing great. We've been, um, industry's very excited and interesting, interested in what we're doing. Um, and at the same time, we're continuing to build our day-to-day -day, um, activities and portfolio that small businesses traditionally compete well in. Okay. So, for example, the um, uh, in construction, right? So I keep thinking of the Inflation Reduction Act, but it's not that. It's the uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure right. the Infrastructure Act. You know, that was new money. So there's a lot of opportunity out there for small businesses to help us rebuild our, our roads, our bridges, um, our critical infrastructure. Through the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, through the Army okay. Corps of Engineers. And you know, that's the Army Corps is a really important component of why the Army does so well in small business opportunity and why some other um, agencies don't have as high mm -hmm. of contributions as we do because they don't they just don't have that portfolio. That luxury. Yeah. So I have a great idea. If you're willing, how about we bring you back at another time and we can kind of slave over now to talk it with more detail about specific Army initiatives, what you're doing, what some of your results and things are, and what you might want to tell the workforce and industry from an okay. Army perspective. Would you be willing to come back at another time? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. This, is, this has been great. I'm so excited. I know. Excited. It went so fast. This, this is, who, who, <laughs> knew, who, knew how fast it, who knew how fast it could be? <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. It's, it's been a thank pleasure you. having you. So thank you very much, and stay tuned for future episodes of All Things Small Business.